Welcome to the Art and Science of Complex Sales. This is a podcast where we explore how the best B2B sales leaders make the complex simple, drive relationships and revenue, and generally elevate the sales profession. In this podcast, we're bringing together sales experts, thought leaders, top account executives, buyers, industry insiders, all to share their experiences and best practices for navigating the complex sales cycle. So whether you're a seasoned sales professional, a sales leader, or just starting out, you're going to find practical insights and actionable advice that you can apply to your own sales journey. Plus, we have a bit of fun. Today, we have an incredible mind and author in the world of sales, Frank Cespedes, a senior lecturer at Harvard Business School and a presence in top-level boardrooms across the nation. Frank is author of the recent essential book for sales leaders, Sales Management That Works, How to Sell in a World That Never Stops Changing. In this episode, get prepared to revolutionize your understanding of the sales landscape. With Frank's help, we navigate the maze of omnichannel buying shedding light on the vital significance of understanding your customers' behaviors, both online and offline, and helping your sales team excel in this reality. We also tackle mounting challenges facing sales managers today, including an alarming lack of understanding of sales functions within the C-suite and how that can drive organizational discord. So let's get rolling. Frank, welcome to the Art and Science of Complex Sales. It's so good to have you on. Paul, it is my pleasure. Uh, It really is. I've admired what Membrane has done for some time. Glad to be here. Well, the feeling is absolutely mutual. And I think you said it earlier when in the uh, in the introduction, when we were just chatting is we're we're both fighting the right battle when it comes to sales. Well, I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. And and that that. uh, So what actually what part of the world just to set what part of the world are you in right now? Uh, Boston. This is where I live. This is where I teach. This is where I am on a gloomy, humid day. Gloomy, humid Boston in the middle of summer. It's a perfect time, perfect time to be talking about sales. So, hey, you have been, let's just jump right in because you've been in the game uh, since 83 as a, you know, a Harvard Business School professor. And then you moved on to, to your own business and have been able to do that. You've written a lot of books on the subject. So, Let's dive into this topic of sales. What is what is sales? Uh, I, by sales, I basically mean business development in an organization, customer retention, customer acquisition, customer profitability. It's a core activity in business. And I gave up years ago, Paul, playing the semantic game. I don't care whether we call that sales marketing or asparagus. It's an activity you better learn how to do if you want a for-profit business. Because if you don't learn how to do it, sooner or later, you're managing a not-for-profit, whether you want to or not. That's what I mean by sales. Awesome. So the chief asparagus officer is focused <laughs> on, focused on. Uh, yes. No, I, I get it. That None of us uh, generally listening to this podcast wants to be running a not-for-profit. So Let's talk about some of the the things that you have seen in sales. And and you talk about this in your book. The most recent book is called Sales Management That Works. But what are some of the new sales realities that you're seeing in the market today? Yeah. The most important thing about selling is always has been, always will be the buyer. Not the seller, but the buyer. What people buy, how they buy, why they buy. That's where we see the big changes. That's where technology, for example, is making the big changes. Uh, For example, uh, and as you know, this is uh, sort of discussed in the book, but if you look at the way buying has been thought about for more than a half century, and as a result, what it is that sales and marketing, the customer acquisition and retention people have to do I'm going to be academic for a moment, but I think it makes the point. It's been conceptualized in terms of what academics call a hierarchy of effects model. In other words, the job is to move the prospect through a funnel pipeline. Think about all the common metaphors in sales Mm -hmm. to move them from awareness to interest, to desire, to action, right? AIDA, as in the Verdi opera. That's not the way most buying journeys work 
in the third decade of the 21st century. It's an omni-channel buying world. Uh, people are online and offline multiple times throughout their buying journeys. And it's no longer a funnel or a pipeline. It's more complex than that. That is, in effect, the big change. And I think people misunderstand what that means. It does not mean that it is a digital eats physical world. You know, again, you'll see the data in the book, but it does, you know, it, it does mean the internet is a big deal. You've got to understand these omni-channel buying journal journeys. And as a result, when and where your salespeople can have the most influence. That, that I think, is what I would say about the changes. So if it's not a funnel, I know, um, for example, Jocko Vandercoy, Winning by Design, they, they, they talk about the bow tie, right? How do you describe it if it's not a, if we're not looking at a funnel or the traditional, how do you describe the process and the, the buying process and the uh, measurement of that? Well, it's more like a series of streams where, again, people are online and offline. Think about consumer markets where influencers, uh, as the name implies, have a great deal of influence. They don't work for the uh, buyer. They don't work for the seller. But in effect, they're vetting and have a lot of influence over purchases. In B2B markets, you've got buying forums where people discuss the vendors, the product, the quality, the service. The point is that buyers in both B2B and B2C markets are getting lots and lots of information from many, many sources besides your website or your salespeople. Again, this does not mean that it's a predominantly online world. E-commerce as a percentage of total US retail sales reached its height quite rightly, in the second quarter of 2020, when there were maximum lockdown conditions because of the pandemic, that height was 16.5%. It's down to about 15% since then, meaning 85 to 90% is not being transacted online. So that's not uh, the result, but it does make a big difference in how you interact with buyers. Well, so that that brings us to, I mean, I could, we could go a couple of places with this, but I'm I'm interested in the people aspect of it then. So how do you how do you take this new reality of sales, this multi-stream reality, uh, and transition a workforce that and it, you know, the younger workforce, I guess, is is uh understands all the different channels. But many of us have just have grown up in the 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 general funnel, right? Uh world of buying. So how do you how do you find and hire the right people for this type of sale? Well, this type I of mean, sales environment. Yeah, I think um, let's step back and talk about sales hiring uh in general because okay. um it has always been a tough task and quite honestly many many companies make it needlessly tougher. There are challenges in sales hiring that simply do not exist to the same extent in any other business function. For example, if you want to hire an engineer, you can go to a school and it's a little bit like walking into a food court. What, what are you interested in? Electrical engineering, chemical engineering, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the same is true if you want to hire people in finance or accounting. You can find people who majored in those subjects. And by the way, despite all the talk in recent years, the same is true about computer programmers. But the last time I looked, which was about three and a half years ago when I, um, uh, when I uh, started writing the book that you kindly mentioned, of the nearly 4,500 colleges and universities in the United States, less than 300 even offered a sales course let alone a sales program. The point being, this is a function in business where the vast majority of people start out knowing very little about what it is they're going to get paid for. It is a classic example of on-the-job learning. 
In addition, many companies make this tough job needlessly tougher. Now, what I'm about to say, Paul, is as close to an established fact as anything you'll ever hear from a management professor. It is supported by over 60 years of consistent research results. And I, I want to emphasize consistent. What the research tells us is that managers vastly overrate their ability to judge somebody's fit for the job and their subsequent actual performance based on one or two interviews. And yet, if you think about sales hiring, that's how most, and by most, I mean in excess of 80%, of sales hiring gets done. And it's only a few interviews because the incentive for most sales managers is, you know, get somebody with a pulse because the longer I keep that position absent, it doesn't help uh, my, uh, my region or territory or whatever meet numbers. Now, the irony is that there are now many, many new tools that can help with this process. But at the end of the day, the issue is not the technology or the tools. At the end of the day, you got to know what skills you're looking for, and you have to devote time to this. So that, I think, is the most important thing I would say about sales hiring. Then in terms of what new competencies are required, the bar is always raising in business. You know, when I say this, a number of our listeners may smile because it sounds glib, but it's sort of a Yogi Berraism. If you think about it, you can see it's wisdom. In business, you do not compete with the dead. You do not compete with companies that have gone out of business. They are, as we say, history. You only compete with the survivors. Now, what does it take to survive in any competitive market? You've got to adopt best practices. You have to improve. Advantage in business is always relative advantage. As a result, the bar is always rising, and sales is a great example of that. Sales is becoming a much more data-intensive activities. So all the things that we have traditionally taken for granted, you know, does this person know the basics? Is, Is he or she persistent? Are they any good with lead gen and lead qualifications? Those basics are table stakes And there's now another set of competencies being layered on top of those in many, many industries. And I want to get back to my first comment. Hiring salespeople is a tougher challenge than hiring in most other business functions. Schools don't help you in doing this. We had some pre-conversations around what I want to call as like sales as a leadership competency. And so it's it's how we take, how we take, you know, what are the table stakes? And what are the areas that you're seeing, you know, as a part of it that we that we're needing to raise the level on all? Let's focus on B two B complex, right? Where are the, the where are the areas that you're seeing that we need to treat as? And I'll I'll use the blanket term leadership competence because we're 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 leading, we're, you know, we're leading people to change every time we make a sale. But what are those aspects of that that really we're needing to invest in and that we're seeing that, you know? When companies are primed for growth and they have to compete at that level, what are the key things that we're looking at? Well, when I think about sales as a leadership issue, I think about leadership at two levels. One, as they say, it begins at the top. So Mm -hmm. let me talk about sales in the C-suite. But then what does it take to be a good sales manager? At the top, uh, it's a very, very important issue. Think, you know, I want to talk about the basics because, um, you know, at this mm-hmm. point in my balding career, I get around. I mean, I, I serve on boards. I've, <laughs> I've been part of as many strategy meetings with CEOs as, you know, anybody in the Western world. And the reality is that many, many C-suites do not understand the basic functions of sales in their attempts to increase enterprise value, stock price, EBITDA, whatever you, you want to call it. Let me talk about two aspects. You know, how do you increase the value of any for-profit business? Basically, two ways you begin with. One is you want to invest 
in projects where the return is greater than the cost of capital, right? This is finance 101. Now, let's think about this. In most businesses, capital investments are made in the service of revenue-seeking opportunities, right? Yep. Sounds like sales to me, customer acquisition, customer retention. But notice how this happens. At the end of the day, customer selection is vital to knowing what projects to invest in. And customer selection doesn't happen by a couple of senior people getting off in a room and talking about it. That's called brainstorming. In most businesses, customer selection is a function of the aggregate call patterns in the sales force. And if the C-suite doesn't understand the metrics, the compensation, the incentives that drive call patterns in their business, they're basically fantasizing about what projects to invest in. At the other end uh, of the spectrum, you want to reduce your cost of capital. Now, again, think about what sales does. The single biggest driver of cash out and cash in in most businesses is the selling cycle, right? So, you know, that determines working capital needs because, you know, expenses tend to accrue while you're chasing opportunities and then you get cash after the sale is made. And by the way, in an inflationary environment, with rising interest rates, and as a result, increased costs of capital, this is a very, very big and growing issue. The point being that what you can do in sales productivity to decrease time to uh, capital is not only a sales management issue, it's a fundamental finance and strategy issue. And the C-suite, one of the leadership competencies, in my view, is a C-suite needs to be in touch with how that does and doesn't really work in their organization. Then the other level is a sales manager, right? And this has always been a, a very, very interesting job. The single biggest complaint that I have heard throughout my career about sales managers from their C-suite colleagues is, you know, we, we, we made Charlie or Charlotte the head of sales. They were our best salesperson. They continue to be a great salesperson, but they can't manage their way out of a paper bag, all right? This is a classic transition. Sales, you usually begin as an individual contributor, and that's how you make your bones, as they say. But once you become a manager, by definition, you've got to get things done through others. Now, we know from other studies that's a tough transition across functions in all business careers, but it's especially tough in sales because most people go into sales and stay in sales because they value the autonomy of the individual contributor. If I make my numbers, they leave me alone. But once you become a manager, you can't be left alone. And let's get back to the first question you asked. In an omni-channel buying world, at the end of the day, you need a multi-channel response. So in on top of the classic sales management um, leadership competencies, you now have to know something about managing that ecosystem, dealing with channel partners. So the leadership requirements there are increasing uh, as well. I, somebody said with a C-suite really hit me. Many C-suites don't understand the basic functions of sales within their business. Like, why, why is that? Tell me, tell me more, because that se seems like a, such a, a critical aspect of, of leading a revenue-producing machine, right? Mm -hmm. That, uh, but what, what gets in the way? What's, what's the barriers? Well, there's um, a, a dirty secret about C-suites uh, around the world. Uh, but I had a colleague... Uh, here at Harvard Business School, Julie Wolf, who did a wonderful bit of research some years ago. And she looked at uh, the evolution of the C-suite. I'm assuming our listeners know what we mean by that jargon, right? CEO, yep. CFO, CMO, you know, senior executive groups. And she looked at the evolution of that in the global 1200 over the last 25 years. 
And what she found is that on average, the number of executives reporting to the CEO in the global 1200 had doubled over the last 25 years, twice as many people. But then if you step back and you ask yourself, well, who are these people? What were they doing before they became senior executives? The reality is actually very few of them were general managers in the sense in which we use that phrase at Harvard Business School or I think uh, in the wider world. Usually by a general manager, we mean someone who was running a line of business or had profit and loss responsibility. Most of these additions to the C-suite have been specialists, the CIO, regulatory, data analytics, et cetera, et cetera. Now, why is that? It's not like uh, companies wake up and say, wow, I got a great idea. Let's get bureaucratic. No, we are going through a sustained data revolution. Specialization has become more important. Think about being a CMO or a chief revenue officer 20 years ago versus today, right? There are much more full-time jobs, but the reality is the C-suites in many, many organizations are, they look ironically more like faculty meetings in a university. They're, they're more discipline-based specialists. And, and this is the other piece of data, the number of people who have become CEOs with a prior prolonged experience in customer facing functions like marketing or sales is at an all time low. The big increase has been with people primarily in, with a finance background. And then after that, think about tech, engineering. But the reality is there are fewer people in the C suite than ever before that have got that prior sustained existential experience with what you and I would call sales and marketing. So that I think is one of the reasons behind the gap that I'm talking about. But again, let's get back to the basics that you've quite rightly articulated, Paul. If you're in a for-profit business and you're out of touch with the way buying occurs in your target market, sooner or later, call it whatever you want, you're gonna get disrupted. You're gonna be in trouble. Yeah, I wrote, it was a long time ago, I wrote, uh probably the wrong terminology for today, but I wrote a blog relative to uh, a sales framework relative to uh, if, if the sales framework can't be understood and led from the C-suite, then we can't necessarily understand the impact all the way down. So, and I'm, I'm not talking maybe global for 1200, but at least at, you know, 500 million and below, if this, if, if a sales uh, if a C-suite can't look at the metrics and truly understand not just the science and the data that goes into that, but the, that's why we call this the art and science, right? But but the art, the effort that their people have to put in to execute the tasks, it, it's more than an engineering problem. Then that yeah. I think you get, I've seen a lot of cultural cultural schisms based on that, where essentially you get a VP of sales that's doing, that is doing everything correct or a chief revenue officer that has has everything uh and they're operating at max capacity for their current their current uh, staff and their current set but the C there's a huge disconnect because the ceo wants more and more and more and more and more yeah, I mean, have you have you seen that i have and i agree with the way you're framing it the way i would put it uh and again it's you know it, you, you it's two levels you got it exactly right one of the realities, you know, business is ultimately a performance art. Business is about what happens, not simply attitude or good intentions. And as a result, there is no such thing as performance in the abstract in business. There's only performance in our market, with our products, at our prices, with our target buyers. And that is what you've got to understand. Now, this does not mean, and I like the way you framed it because I, I agree with you, this does not mean that if you're a CIO or a CFO, you need to be a, a sales manager. In fact, you'd probably screw things up. You just mm -hmm. don't have the background. But to your point, you've got to understand those resource allocations if, in fact, what sales does 
is going to increase enterprise value and execute strategy. Otherwise, it's top line motion. May be good for salespeople's comp, but not necessarily good for the shareholders, investors, and so forth. When you talk about this in the book, really in a number of ways, but where I really connect is this idea of the sales model and process, right? How we how we construct, we we clarify that model, but in a way that's understandable and executable from the company perspective, not from a sales team's perspective, right? And and do you mind sharing a little bit about that? Like essentially building these models as a as a way to increase that shareholder revenue. Yeah. Well, I mean, the first thing I'd say, we'll we'll get back to um my answer to your first good question, you know, what's changing. Um, the reality is because of the were the rest of them not good? <laughs> <laughs> they were good. <laughs> that one was really good. <laughs> but the, the reality is m- many, many sales models are are outdated. They're dealing, they're basically based on obsolete assumptions about how buying happens. And it's buying that drives sales models. It's not sales models that drive buying. You know, we got to get uh, cause and effect um, uh, right here. The second thing I think, uh, and by the way, I think the analytics that are now available, and for that matter, the pandemic has made this more visible to many companies. Let me let me start with the pandemic. I think one of the things the pandemic revealed to many companies is that in effect, they were overpaying for many tasks in their sales models. Turns out we don't need our most expensive, most experienced enterprise reps to do lead generation. Probably not the best use of their time. We can do it with kids right out of school in an inbound marketing model or even with an algorithm. There are many demos, pitches you can do online. You don't need to incur the travel and entertainment expense. The larger issue here, however, is the the issue of how do you allocate your sales people and as a result, align your sales model with where they make the biggest impact as opposed to what marketing can do. Or, you know, you mentioned SaaS, uh, Jocko's uh, company winning by design, as opposed to what post-sale customer success people can do. That, I think, is the big issue. And by the way, technology, if you know what you're doing, if you're in touch with buying, technology is your friend in sales in doing this. It's not replacing Mm -hmm. you. It is a tool that you can use to leverage better allocation of resources. I think that's where we're seeing most of the real productive innovation in sales models. Yeah, it, that hits the heart of uh, one of the things I'm noticing in market. I mean, chief revenue officer of a of a software company, right? But in terms of, of membrane itself, I'm I'm actually finding the technology. There's been a great push towards the, a focus on technology recently. Meaning, and and I what I mean by focus is strip the things that don't work, that don't add value to that sales model. And add the things that that leverage and empower the the talent that you actually have, because the sales tech stack blew up so big in in the past you know twenty years, it just got massive. SaaS came about, and the the tech staff just well, you see, it, it has just blown up. There's this interesting there's this interesting thing going on. I, it's almost a renaissance where there's there's some stripping away and refinement and it's I really like it. I love it because that's where we're that's one of the things we're focused on. Uh, but getting the right tech for the right problem is in the right model is now more is now more doable than ever. I right? I I agree and um I also what does it take to focus? To focus you focus on those areas where you believe the leverage is. Now, one way you don't focus is, you know, I love this phrase that has become so fashionable, digital transformation. You know, you can drive a truck through that phrase. What the heck is happening? (laughs) The reality is most executives don't have a clue what it means. When we talk about sales, in my experience, you begin by looking at two places. The first is, how do you increase 
the amount of time your salespeople actually have in customer contact. Now, the data I'm about to cite, Paul, obviously will vary by company and industry. But if you ask a basic question about sales, on average, how much time does a salesperson spend in customer contact? And by the way, by customer contact here, I don't simply mean delivering a pitch online or in person. I mean all forms of customer contact, webinars, demos, email, etc. Mm. On average, that number is usually somewhere between 30 and 35%. Now think about this. Think about what is it if you can make 35%, 40%, if you can make 40, 45%, nirvana, if you can make it 50% or more, that is not only a huge productivity increase in most companies, it is also something that increases your addressable market. Because segments that were economically infeasible to reach now become feasible with better go-to-market utilization. So that's, uh, that's number one, increasing selling time. And by the way, I think that's exactly uh, where technology and, um, uh, and redeployment helps. And then the other is, I think, in, in enabling salespeople, call it training and development. But it, th this is a basic fact about adult learning and salespeople are just basically ground zero for this. Adults pay attention to information when they need it and where they need it, not weeks or months earlier or later in a training seminar. What L&D people call the forgetting curve is very, very steep in sales. Research says most salespeople forget about 80% of what they heard in a seminar less in less than 90 days. Good example of short-termism. When do these people pay attention to information? On their way to make a sales call or during the actual sales conversation? This is where the new sales enablement technologies help. If you understand learning processes, they help a lot. You get that information to them on the iPhone, on the iPad. Um, many of these people learn visually, orally, that this is what those the media allow you to do. So those are the first two places I look to focus and try to bring down to earth, you know, digital this and digital that. And by the way, there's a lot of room for improvement in those areas in the vast majority of companies. I have found one of the most effective things um, across all areas. It, it, I didn't know that stat on adult learning or that, that information on adult learning, but it makes a bunch of sense. But to be able to present uh, within the context of a sales process or within the context of a sales conversation or within the context of a, a pipeline, you know, if it's if it's a step I have to take to be able to present the coaching for that step as well as the materials for that step directly there and have it available on demand, um, you know, and do that in a variety of, of formats, right? So some it's some like a video, some like to have a uh, prompts with questions to ask, those type of things. But like sales sales enablement in that regard takes. It kills the idea of training, like training. It, like you said, that one-time event, that eighty percent of it is lost. But if you don't, if you don't take that training and then actualize it in the context of your actual sales process, that you work so hard to construct and clarify this model and process and everything that you've done, if you don't present the information in that context, it's just lost. No, no I, matter no matter how many times you tell people or slack it to them or this, that, and the other, it's it's lost. No, I agree. And I like the way you phrased it at the end. Remember, I'm a professor, so let's not forget the classroom entirely. <laughs> the classroom is, Excuse me. the research here is pretty definitive. The classroom, whether we call it a university classroom or the training seminar, actually is a very small people, a, a small proportion of the way people learn on the job. And sales is a great example. Salespeople are a great example of what the learning people call modeling behavior. In other words, the way most salespeople get better is essentially by looking at the best of their peers and how those peers deal with the buyers. You know, the way you dealt with that price objection, Paul, that was clever. I'm going to use that. The way you frame the value proposition. 
This is what the technology allows you to scale up and accelerate. It allows you to disseminate this best practice and you know make modeling behavior, ramp up time, et cetera, more, um, more accessible to your people. Companies that aren't using this, you know, what can I say? Uh, it's their fault uh, because precisely because the stack has become so vast, God bless capitalism. All these all these vendors are decreasing price because of competition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, they're de increasing, uh, decreasing price and then integrating features. Right. So it's becoming that those are the two races uh, that who can keep up with the feature integration and who can. It's, so it's just what I'm seeing in market. It's a lot of a lot of that. I know that's just general. What always happens, right? That's capitalism. That is just what happens. Yeah. Let's hope so. <laughs> yes. Yes. Exactly. That's innovation, right? It's yeah. absolute innovation. Um, so let's. We're getting close to time. I'd like to ask one final question, which is a generalized question, and you could take it any way that you any way that you take it. I uh, want to take it in any way that you want to go, but. You have an audience. Our audience is, is generally C level uh, people at, in revenue. So, chief revenue officers, VPs of sales. We have an, uh, a great audience of CEOs, generally at the small to medium business, uh, and then a lot of just sales practitioners. So, with that, what is the conclusion? What is one thing that you believe that everybody within sales today, and that's a very broad statement, everybody within that audience, can be doing to execute more effectively. Well, very I mean, broad, very yeah. broad. No, I understand. Uh, can I can I cite two things? Yes, absolutely. Because one of them will get me back to basics. Make sure you're in touch with your buyers as they buy today, not yesterday. All right, that lag effect. One of the smartest things that I ever heard. Um, this occurred about 30 years ago. I was young. I had a full head of hair. I was writing a case study. I probably smelled like a recent graduate student. And uh, one of the executives I was interviewing for the case said something that I've learned the wisdom of over the years. He said, Frank, watch what you're going to see in your career. Sales and marketing in most companies is managed the way it should have been managed five to 10 years in the past in that industry. Why? Because that was the last time the people making the really important resource allocation decisions in sales and marketing had continuous sustained customer contact. And I've discovered there's some truth to what he's saying, that this lag effect is built in. So that's number one. Number two has to do with change, right? Change is a constant, right? It, 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 there'll always be change because of creative destruction, uh, et cetera. And here, let me just say this to the audience. You're my kind of people, the folks you described as your audience. But the reality is people in sales and marketing always talk a good game about change. They always sound hip. They always sound, you know, we welcome change. The reality is the inertia in that function is very, very high for systemic reasons, reasons that go beyond any individual's temperament. So many other decisions in any business depend upon sales forecasts and the ability of the sales force to meet those forecasts, hiring in all functions, production capacity, operations, CapEx investments, et cetera. As a result, people in sales and marketing typically have short-term measures. Make sure you make the numbers not just this year, this quarter, this month. Again, I always remember what uh, uh, an executive said to me when I was young, a sales executive. He said, Frank, in my line of work, if I don't survive the short term, I don't have to worry about the long term. The reality, though, is that many, many sales managers, including chief revenue officers, because of their metrics, they avoid all transition costs. Even when they know it might be better, they stick with the devil they know. And as a result, that's how you get disrupted. So those would be the things. Make sure you're in touch with buying as it, as it is occurring today. And then forget the rhetoric about change. The reality is if you get too far out of step 
with the way people buy in your market, you will be disrupted and your metrics usually don't help you make that transition. That's the reality. Those are two extremely, um, I wrote them both down. I got them, we got them recorded. Two great tips and two that I'm going to take back directly from this and and uh, it actually trained my whole team on because it's 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 brilliant. Two last questions. Number one, where do people find Frank when they want to uh, get in touch? Well, um, you know, there's LinkedIn there. I do have a website, but I have to confess, Paul, I haven't been to that website in probably a year. (laughs) I'm not sure what's there. And then, you know, there's faculty pages that I think are publicly available where I teach at at Harvard Business School. But it's it's the usual places. Fantastic. And the second is... uh, can I ask? I want to ask you right right now. Will you come back on? Because this was a fantastic conversation. I would love to schedule another one. You make it user friendly. I'd be I'd be delighted. We can go into some other topics if you wish. Fantastic. So I'm going to ask everybody when we post this on uh, as you're listening to it. If we post this on, uh, we're going to post it on LinkedIn and some other channels. Make sure that you ping me back, Paul, on my LinkedIn with with things that you want. Uh, to hear Frank discuss, because I think this was a fantastic discussion and we absolutely can dive into this. So thank you so much, Frank. It was awesome. Uh, enjoy the gloomy day in, in Boston. See the light. Hope it's shining bright sometime soon. And uh, with that, we are heading out from the Art and Science of Complex Sales. Go Red Sox. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> All righty. Thank you so much for listening to the Art and Science of Complex Sales. This podcast is sponsored by Membrane and our partners from around the globe. Here at Membrane, we believe that B2B sales is at a crossroads. Due to decades of quantity-based prospecting, information overload, and really a shift towards efficiency over service and pitching over leadership in sales, customers are saying enough is enough. They're tuning out average performers and choosing to take most of the buying journey on their own. This results in up and down sales results, forecasts that are all over the place, and salespeople that are half committed due to the fact that they're having poor results and they have an inability to truly connect with customers. We believe the road successful companies are taking to combat this is threefold. Number one, training to create leaders and executives across all areas of the team with strong habits and sales methodologies that bring value. Number two, technology. Technology that focuses and helps a salesperson succeed and reinforces great habits rather than wasting their time on filling out fields for reporting or wasting their time on spamming customers that have no interest in ever buying. Third, talent. And I'm talking about talent that's empowered and emboldened to make a difference for their customers and their companies. So where are you on that journey? Membrane and our network of partners across the globe are here to help and to elevate the sales profession. We streamline critical technology by combining CRM, training and enablement, and more into one seamless platform. We drive best-in-class methodologies through our partners. They provide the top thought leadership methodologies and resources from across the globe. And our collective efforts are dedicated to recruiting, training, coaching, and empowering, and measuring the habits of the top teams in the world to ensure success. Join us at Membrane.com to learn more. And thank you so much for listening.